Hello, everybody. This is Martha Alter Hines with Living the One Light. Um, and today I want to drop into something a little bit special I'm excited to talk about, uh, which is the full moon in Capricorn that we have coming up on July 3rd, 2023. Um, but the special thing that I'm really excited to drop into with all of you is the fact that this full moon is going to be squared by the Kuiper Belt object, the dwarf planet Celestia. And um, so I'm feeling called to drop into what is Celestia, who is Celestia, what does that maybe symbolize or feel like, or what is that doing in this time? Um, <clears throat> and then also just some of my thoughts about the, this really, really powerful moment that we are in, especially as we move into July. Uh, July is going to be pretty off the chart astrologically in terms of its depth and power and so I just want to give some of my feelings and thoughts on that um <clears throat> yeah so um okay let's start with the full moon and Celestia so so the full moon is happening on July 3rd 2023 it's going to be the moon itself is going to be at 11 degrees of Capricorn the sun will be at 11 degrees of Cancer and uh, like I said, the the moon itself is going to be, or the moon and the sun will both be squared by Celestia. So I'm going to show you the chart briefly, and then I'm going to um, talk a little bit about Celestia because these Kuiper Belt objects are really beautiful and call to me a lot. As I, I've, if any of you have listened to any of my videos before, you probably realize it because I've been talking about them a lot. And I talked about them in a video I did with Heather Ensworth about a month ago. Um, and yeah, I just, I love them. So let's take a look real quick here. All right. So this is the chart for the full moon. Um, here is the moon at 11 degrees and 18 minutes of Capricorn. Here's the sun at 11 degrees, 18 minutes of Cancer. And, you know, Juno was conjunct the new moon that happened uh, in Gemini. Just I'm recording this on Thursday, June 22nd. So we just had the new moon in Gemini uh, last Saturday and that new moon was conjunct Juno. So the, the sun and Juno will still be very close to each other. And then also Mercury will be there with the sun. And opposing that moon and then celestia here is celestia so her icon is is like a seashell and she is currently at nine degrees of aries well she will sorry she will be at nine degrees of aries um on this full moon she moves really slowly she moves a little bit more slowly than pluto and in, in a second i'm going to show you her orbit so i can we can drop in a little bit to what the the being of celestia you know, just how she moves and where she is in, in our solar system. Um, yeah, so I'm going to come out of this for a second and just, just drop into who Celestia is. So mythologically, Celestia, I'm not an expert on her at all, but I will tell you what I do know. She is the wife of Neptune. And the story that I know of her is that um, essentially Neptune fell in love with her, wanted to be with her, and she didn't believe that he was in love with her. So she went away and Neptune really, really was in love with her and sent a dolphin after her to tell her that he really did want to be with her. And then, so the dolphin went and found her and and then Neptune and Celestia were together. That's incredibly abridged short version <laughs> but that's the gist so she's she's you know um a mermaid she has like mermaid energy water nymph energy and her sister was a water nymph and is actually the moon there's a moon that 
orbits Celestia, the, the physical body Celestia, and that moon is named after the sister of Celestia, who is a water nymph. Um, so now let me show you if I can get up on the screen correctly, the actual orbit of Celestia, because it's, I always love to feel into what these, um, the physical body of these beings is. Let me get you to the right place here. Okay. So this is a, a view of the Celestia orbit. If you're looking at it from the top down and you can see here is the inner, here's the sun way in the middle. This is the inner, um, the in, these are the inner planets. This is right here is the orbit of Jupiter. Then is Saturn, then is Uranus, then here is Neptune. And then this pink, pink circle is um, Pluto. So you can see that the orbit of Pluto becomes elliptical. It's, it's less circular than the orbit of the other planets. Um, and then the orbit of, of Celestia is, is also somewhat elliptical. And it's, it's longer than the orbit of Pluto. It's similar to the orbit of Pluto but it is a bit longer. So if you know anything about Eris Zena, which I did a free talk on a couple of months ago, the orbit of Eris Zena is double the orbit of Pluto and Celestia basically, right? So, um, so Celestia is a little bit, has a little bit of a longer orbit than Pluto, but not that much, not that different from Pluto. Um, but then if you take a look, at the orbit from the side, here is what you see. This right here is the the orbital plane, the elliptic. You know the like M Melanie Reinhardt talks about how the she thinks of the the plane of our solar system, the most of the planets as they orbit around the sun being like the like a a fried egg, and you know essentially sort of mostly flat. Um, the orbit of Pluto then starts to go off that ecliptic and and then the most of the Kuiper Belt objects are really at a tilt. Like their orbit is not, it is not the same as what the Earth does, what Mercury does, what Venus does, what Uranus does, um, et cetera, right? They, the orbits of these outer planets are really different from what we think of when we think of our zodiac. When we think of the main signs in, you know, what we talk about in astrology as um, Aries, Pisces, Aquarius, etc. That's following this orbit that that the earth does that these main planets do through sky and so when we are looking at the orbits of these outer these Kuiper belt objects in particular like Aristina is you know even more tilted than than this and but Celestia also is orbiting in a way that is um really off our ecliptic right it's doing its own thing and uh, one thing I learned as I was researching her a little bit is that currently Celestia is in her orbit is is out is up at the the most mm, the point kind of at the farthest of this tilt right now. So that's just really interesting. So she's she you know she's kind of in a sense the furthest away from the orbit that we take around the sun that she gets. Um, not like the the most precise furthest away, but she's pretty far away. So she's really out there doing her own thing in a, in a sense, which I find really interesting. And I just, I like to kind of honor that and feel into what does that say or feel like, or, um, you know, I don't feel like there's any right or wrong answer with regard to that, but it does feel really important to recognize that 
for example, on this full moon, Selassie will be at nine degrees of Aries, quote unquote. But but when we talk about nine degrees of Aries, we're assuming that Selassie is following the plane of the ecliptic, which she's she she's not. And in fact, she's the farthest off of it that she gets, which is pretty far off. And so she's in a part of the sky that's that's not actually um, Aries. Anyway, so um, nevertheless, <laughs> I also feel like it is, I think of all of these, anything in existence, including planets, including, you know, all of these celestial beings as energetic vibrational um entities because we are all of us are that's what we are we're vibration so <clears throat> when i when i drop into any relationship between any two objects for example let's say um the moon and the sun on a full moon right their relationship when when they're when it's a full moon the moon and the sun are opposite each other so they're having this dance energetically vibrationally that you know that one is facing the other one and so their vibrations are kind of doing a dance like this opposite each other so it's really a dance about polarity and about balance and when we have something squaring something um like on this full moon Celestia, if we think of her being on the ecliptic, which she's not, uh, then she'll be squaring. She'll be in between the sun and the moon, basically, right? But she's not. She's actually so okay. <laughs> if the if I if you imagine the on this full moon, the the moon will be over here in Capricorn, the sun will be over here in Cancer, and the Earth will be in the middle. And then if Celestia were on the ecliptic, she would be perpendicular to the earth, the sun and the moon over here in Aries. But actually she'll be like, if you wanna say quote unquote above where Aries is. <laughs> well, anyway, and there's more complication to that, but let's just pretend I'm simplifying, super simplifying. The relationship that that Celestia will have in in our sky won't really be that that direct square that we think of because she's off of our ecliptic. However, um, I still, you know, if I drop into okay, well, but where is she and what is that energetic vibrational relationship between Celestia and the sun and the moon and the earth in that moment? She's still in this dance that is is like she's holding the space up here, let's say, that's evenly spaced between where the sun is and the moon is in relation to the earth. So um, she's still kind of like talking, I would say, equally, in a sense, to the sun and the moon and the earth. So there's still this this relationship this dance this dynamic that is that i feel you know really strongly in squares where there's like a an opportunity to talk there's an opportunity to really like dialogue and um yeah so i'm just i'm just kind of that's maybe feels complicated or maybe it feels interesting or maybe all of the above and again, I don't feel like there's any right or wrong way to approach it. Um, I just want to name that it's not as simple maybe as I have thought of it before. And and I really like to feel into, okay, physiologically, what's going on actually in the cosmos with these beings? Um, and, you know, you could drop into that in your own way. And, and I love to help people drop into that also um, in a lot of the, the things that I hold. But and I'll, I'm going to be doing that more coming up as a preview <laughs> coming up in uh, starting in February of next year. I am getting told very clearly to 
start my own astrology course, which is going to be called um, Infinite Soul Wisdom Astrology 101. And just as a little, little preview of that, you know, what I'm feeling really called to do in that is to, it'll, it'll be a perfect thing for anybody of any level of astrology knowledge, either you, you're, you could, you could join and you know, absolutely nothing about astrology all the way to, you are a practicing full-fledged astrologer. Um, and what I am feeling really called to do in that journey, it's going to be a year long course. We're going to go sign by sign through the Zodiac, starting with the new moon in Pisces. And so every month we're going to meet and really feel into the sign that happens to be associated with the new moon at that time. And then the, the planets that are associated with those signs. So for example, when we dive into Pisces, um, we will definitely, you know, have our own journey, our own relationship, really feel into both Pisces and Neptune. And I might bring in Jupiter too, because Jupiter is a traditional ruler of Pisces. And I feel that energetic really strongly, even though that's not how I was taught, but it just feels very important. Um, so, so yeah, so in general, I really feel called to hold space for us each to come into our own relationship with these, these are beings, these are alive beings in, in the cosmos, just like we are. And, um, and we each have our own knowing, like our own ancient way of knowing about our relationships to them and, and the wisdom of them and what they are, what the energetic of them is, what the song of them is. So, um, yeah, I'll say more about that over time, but if that interests you, definitely get in touch with me and I will, uh, over the next month or two, I'll start to make it available to, you know, sign up for that. And, um, I'll be feeling into more of how I feel called to hold that, but I have a lot of ideas and I'm really excited because I think it's, it's going to be diff very different from any other way of learning astrology that I've seen out there it'll be similar it'll definitely incorporate evolutionary astrology for sure because that's my main learning and it will incorporate um some elements sort of of shamanic astrology but i'm not officially trained in that it's more like taking a combination of what i've learned from ari moshe wolf and evolutionary astrology combine it with what i've learned from heather ensworth who you know has her own combination of really beautiful ways of approaching astrology and then bringing in my own relationship with the spirit world, my own relationship with this planet and with all the planets and the cosmos and life. <laughs> um, and yeah. And then yours, your, that's the big part. That's why I'm going to be, it's going to be called infinite soul wisdom, astrology 101, because what I'm really called to do is hold space for you, for each of us, to come back into this way of knowing it deep in ourselves and our souls and our beings, um, our own relationship with everything, with life. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's a little side note, but I'm really excited and I've gotten the, the green light to go ahead and actually plan it, which is great. <laughs> so, so that's coming February, 2024. Um, okay, so back to celestia and the full moon um yeah okay so i think that's enough on you know where it is in the sky and all of that but here's what i wanted to say about celestia herself and and how i'm feeling in this the astrology of this time is um I'm going to come back to the chart for one second so I can say a few more things about the actual astrology. Okay. So something that is occurring right now and that will be intensifying. It's very intense already. It's, again, this is June 22nd, 2023, 20, as I'm saying all this. But what is occurring that is so deeply powerful and intense is the fact that Pluto is squaring the nodes of the moon. And um, 
as we move into July, that is that square is going to become more and more and more and more and more and more and more intense until it becomes exact in the middle of July. And it'll be exact for a number of days, actually. And um, I have been feeling the intensity of that so strongly for quite a while. And it's gotten especially intense in the last couple of weeks, I would say. So that, you know, is just through July is really profound. Um, and so a few things I want to say about that. Um, what I've been really reflecting on is that in this time, you know, a lot of people talk about how this is a choice point in human evolution, consciousness, et cetera. And I have been feeling that big time in my own life and my personal life. Um, and this is something else I talked about with Heather Ensworth and that she talks about is in every moment, we really have a choice. You know, the, this is not easy. This is hard. Some of this is, is difficult. Is the, We're really, I feel, speaking for myself, um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts, but I really do feel that we have this moment. We're being asked to like almost come through a birth canal or, um, you know, be the caterpillar that goes into the chrysalis and goes and becomes the goop and then eventually becomes the butterfly. Um, that's not easy to do a lot of the time. It's very scary and it's often difficult to even know how to do it. So one thing I've been noticing in my own life and myself and people around me is um, it requires a lot of surrender a lot of the time and it requires pretty consistent dedication to love. That's really actually what I feel. And dedication to letting go of power, dedication to letting go of a lot of things that maybe we feel like we need in one way or another. And <clears throat> it's like, I feel this calling to just continuously over and over and over again, have a mantra of surrendering to the divine, surrendering to the divine, surrendering to love, surrendering to love over and over and over and over again. Um, because what I'm observing around me is that again, there's a choice and I feel like my sense is that in this moment, in this time, it would be very easy to get thrown off, to get thrown off center and to, um, if we're not truly, you know, dedicated to being completely grounded, clear, aligned, and, and have a way of coming back to that over and over and over again. And even if we are dedicated to that, <laughs> um, it's very, it can be very easy right now to get thrown off center. So we need, we need ways to bring ourselves back to that grounding, that center, that aligning. And, and a lot of what I do is hold space for that to happen. Um, and it's easier said than done. <laughs> uh, but I have been observing lately what i would say is you know varying levels of my judgment being that some people are choosing love and other people are not and and i've personally been feeling a lot of grief around this my again my judgment my observation my sense that some people are not choosing love and that's just sad it just to me it just is um, and at the same time, regardless of what other people are doing or not doing, or what our perception of what other people are doing or not doing is, is the, what the spirit world keeps saying to me is, okay, they had a choice. Maybe their path, their path will eventually lead to the same place that everyone is going and everyone already is, which is love, which is the one which is the divine which is source we can't not be that and for the sake of our own ease the sake of you know this moment the sake of us um collectively 
coming through this birth canal as easefully and gracefully as possible. Let's choose love, please. <laughs> Let's do that. That's my that's my prayer. That's my dedication. I'm I'm doing everything I possibly can to be that. And I'm not perfect. And um yeah, just I just feel called to say that. Um so that's kind of like the base note. That's like the the backdrop to everything happening right now is this square of Pluto to the notes. It's so so deeply intense it's like a deep soul level moment of an opportunity to choose love that's really the bottom line of what i'm feeling right now okay so given that base note then we bring in selassia okay let's talk about selassia because that was heavy and difficult and selassia is exciting and beautiful for me <laughs> so, she's like Yes, let's switch topics. No, it's all the same topic, but okay. So Celestia, so she is the wife of Neptune, but more importantly to me, she is, she represents um, the shimmering light of the, the ocean, the water, the salt water. In particular, she's related to salt water. She's also, she also can be related to the bubbling streams of, you know, that's the fresh water and land. Um, but when I feel into Celestia energy, and again, I would love your take on it, love your thoughts on it. I feel like there's no real expert out there on any of these Kuiper Belt objects or really anything. It's, again, so important to me that we each have our own relationship to all of it. So what I feel when I feel into Celestia energy is beautiful, beautiful, powerful reminder of this... Um, of light. So Celestia, Kelly Hunter talks about Celestia. And actually, if you haven't signed up for the Rebecoming the One free symposium, Kelly Hunter did an amazing conversation with me that's part of the free set of talks that comes out this coming Sunday, uh, June 25th. And that, that talk is called Cosmic Couples. And one of the couples she talks about in our conversation is Celestia and Neptune. Highly, 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 highly recommend that conversation. So again, if you haven't signed up for free for that, definitely, definitely do. That link will be here with this with this video. Um, but Kelly Hunter talks about Celestia as being associated with um, the sparkling of the light on the sea and also salt, the salts of the sea. So Celestia means salt. And um, and when we were having that conversation, and also when I'm feeling into it now, something that came to me was this unbelievably beautiful sense that maybe one of the energetics, the energies of Celestia is, you know, Neptunian energy is associated with Pisces and, and so can be very ethereal. Neptune is the god of the sea, but we tend to think of Neptune and Pisces as very um, kind of nebulous, like, like the ethers. And Celestia, if she's associated with salt, to me, I associate that with light and with crystals and with, you know, like the crystalline form of salt. So, so something that came to me is maybe the Celestia energy helps us to, in a sense, embody Neptunian energy, Piscean energy. It's a way of, of um, maybe Celestia energy is like a combination of earth and ether, that we are the embodiment, the crystalline light form as an earth being who is divine, right? They're like... It's so beautiful. It's, it's, ah, it's, it's like just amazing for me. Um, and I have been feeling more and more and more and more and more called into this reality that we are becoming these crystalline light form beings that we are. Um, and, and, you know, my academic side, again, questions all that and wonders what the heck are you talking about? But it's what I get told over and over and over again. And the seventh book in the set of eight that I'm channeling is going to be called The Crystals Speak. 
and it is all about it's going to be <laughs> it has I haven't channeled it yet but it's I have been told it's going to be about the crystalline light being realities that are re-emerging and that are we're we're being held to come into so there's something super key and super important about this crystalline light being reality of ourselves as a combination of earth divine crystalline light form all as one that, that that's you know that's what i feel us being energetically really held and and um supported to re-become or to remember that that's help help ourselves to remember that that's what we are and i feel that in that Selassie energy with the, the combination of the image of a of salt the salt crystals and the light on the on the shimmering on the sea really beautiful so powerful and another set of things i feel when i when i really you know drop into the Selassie energy is i feel again powerful light beings of all different kinds these massive um light beings who are you know uh and angelic beings angels archangels um the unicorns the dragons the all these these light form beings who are so massive so powerful and who truly are part of what is meant to be co-creating with us and to be in in relationship with us continuously always they're you know that's our natural way of being is to be in relationship with the infinite dimensions of this planet earth and i've talked about that a little bit um you know i see all kinds of earth beings in all different dimensions and i also experience these light beings, these angels and in all different versions of um, infinite dimensions of these incredibly beautiful, benevolent light beings also, again, of all, all shapes and sizes and forms and yeah, so, so, so many of them. Um, and again, they're powerful and they're here and they're present and they are part of what's helping to wake us back up. Um, I also have personally incredibly powerful and strong relationships with ocean beings, which also feels like, you know, I'm really supposed to start talking about this. It's something I, I haven't talked about any of this really much publicly. I write about it or channel it a little bit in Living the One Light and Gaia speaks the first two books in that series which are published um and on amazon and on my websites but but i haven't spoken about it publicly very much because again i feel i feel nervous to do that and i'm i'm just gently moving forward with, with helping myself move past that nervousness <laughs> so here i am talking about it um but yeah, I have incredibly, incredibly powerful relationships with ocean beings, especially I've had particularly strong um, experiences with them in Scotland, in the part of Scotland where my family is from on the Western Isles of Scotland. Very, very powerful, deeply transformative rela relationship that I have with those beings. Um, and then also I have very strong relationship to ocean beings here where I live in off the coast of California. Very healing, very, very dynamic. They, you know, they have their own set of medicine. They have their own way of knowing. They have their own world, really. And I've had actual healing, healing experiences happen to me, happen for me, and happen with clients of mine. Um, here locally, you know, that just, I can't explain in any other way, except that these are real beings. They really are. <laughs> so that's my experience of them. And, um, and again, so coming back to Celestia, I feel in her, this reminder that, yeah, the, these beings are so incredibly powerful. And when we remember them and we tap into them, it's like this whole, whole other thing comes alive in us. 
and I feel this whole other way of being held, um, being brought into alignment with ourselves as the divine and brought into alignment with ourselves as uh, with the light, the power of the light and the reality of, of the radical balance and harmony of existence of the, of source of the divine that is our natural state of being and that is the ultimate state of healing, the ultimate state of knowing the all that is of you know any question we could possibly have is just it just exists the answer just it, it just is when we come back into the reality of ourselves as the divine divine it's um the answers are just here and healing is also just kind of here in a sense and so Celestia feels like she's she's a reminder of all of that um that we have forgotten that we have you know our ancestors ways of knowing has been suppressed and all around the world we're all we're all um literally indigenous to this planet right and many of us speaking for myself our our reality of being indigenous to this planet has has gotten disconnected um so and i've talked about this in other places you know i won't go on about it right here but my family is the most recent immigrate the most recent immigrants to the united states were my great great grandfather who came from from scotland and my scottish family is largely from the western isles of scotland and they're gaelic speaking and um as many of you probably realize but i didn't know until a few years ago that they were native gaelic speakers and uh not that many generations ago i mean what like four generations ago and <clears throat> most gaelic speakers in scotland were forced to not speak gaelic the children were not allowed to learn it in schools you know it, the whole way of being the whole culture the gaelic culture was really uh directly oppressed and so all of their ways of knowing their speaking their language was um colonized and and often brutally beaten out of them so that, that you know we know that that's that's true for most of us in some part of our lineage um or all around this world and and so that indigenous way of knowing uh again speaking for myself is so present and so alive and and not that long ago was very known in my own family so like in my family i talk about this in other places again but women supposedly in my family in scotland had quote unquote second sight that probably helps explain a lot of my way of being <laughs> um and yet uh i i my mother didn't know that my grandmother didn't know that you know and so it was and my great great grandfather probably didn't know that it, but his mother did his mother was, you know, grew up and was an adult when she came to the United States and, and it's her family that supposedly had the second sight. So, um, yeah, anyway, so we're, re we're all reconnecting to that reality of ourselves and, and, um, it's crucial, it's absolutely crucial that we do that for so many reasons. And again, I talk about that in lots of other places that, and, have written the first draft of a book, which you can actually get on my website for just a few dollars because it's not a, it's not a fully published book yet. And but it's called um, Consciousness in Bloom is is the book that I will be publishing probably next year when I expand it. The first draft is done and ready, and you can have that. But um, it's just absolutely crucial that we come back into this remembering of all of our ways of knowing. And so again, Celestia, I feel like is holding that space, reminding us of that. And the Quaver Belt objects in general, I feel reminding us of that. So yes. Okay. <laughs> um, that was a lot. Um, feeling into if there's anything else I feel called to say. 
I'm just going to look at this chart one more time because there is one other pretty significant thing going on in this chart, um, among other things. So again, the moon, 11 degrees of Capricorn, going to be squaring Celestia, nine degrees of Aries. And the moon also will be trining Jupiter, which is in Taurus. So again, you know, I feel like that's another set of energies helping us to remember ourselves as Earth, helping ourselves to remember ourselves as bodies. And um, and Jupiter is going to be in Taurus for the rest of 2023. So it's just such strong energy also with Uranus there and the North Node finishing its time in Taurus, just such a strong emphasis in expanding and realigning the reality that we are Earth, we are the body of Earth, and we are also the light being of Earth, you know, in combination with that Celestia energy, so powerful and strong. Um, then just the, then there's other, you know, lots of other things I could talk about, but the other thing I feel, do feel called to say, to name is that uh, at the moment of this full moon and also a bit before the full moon, Venus will be squaring Uranus um, and Venus and Mars are going to be, they're not going to be exactly conjunct this year, but they are going to be very, very, getting very, 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 very close at the time of this full moon and and mars is going to move on but venus is going to go retrograde um on july 22nd right after the exact conjunct the exact square of pluto to the nodes and when venus goes retrograde it will be at 28 degrees of leo um <clears throat> opposite eros which by then will have gone retrograde and will be at 27 degrees of aquarius so that's a whole topic in and of itself. But um, but at the time of this full moon, Venus will be squaring Uranus. And so again, this combination of you know, Black Moon Lilith, Venus, Mars, Pallas Athena, all in Leo, being square to Uranus in Taurus again to me is another. Uranus doing, you know, Uranus and Taurus just in general is, is an energy to me of realigning ourselves again with the reality that we are the intelligence of the divine. We are in the intelligence of the divine as earth, as our bodies and Venus rules Taurus and Venus in Leo is very, very, very much about ourselves as creative, the creative life force of source. And, you know, in the square to Uranus and Taurus again is kind of echoing what I said about all of this, of the energy of Selassia, just it's bringing us back to the reality of ourselves as the beauty, the love, the creation life force of source and al aligning again, aligning us with um, what it is to be the intelligence of source as earth. So again, with Selassia, this reality that we are, this we're light beings, we're the crystalline light form that is the combination of both earth and the divine as one. And, you know, the earth moving more and more as I feel her at least coming into her own light being form as we're all being held in this, this oneness of the light of all things and really um, radically shifting and coming into this, this way of being where we remember who we are continuously and we just, relax and allow um allow ourselves to really come back into who are we what are we you know what is this as we have pluto squaring the nodes of the moon um we we're this we're the caterpillar going into the chrysalis and becoming the goop and then becoming the butterfly and i would say overall um you know, the big picture of all of this is that with the that full moon being in Capricorn and Pluto being in Capricorn, and that's they're both ruled by Saturn in Pisces, you know, it's this this whole set of question of okay, Capricorn and Saturn have to do with form. And Pluto 
being in Capricorn, especially squaring the nodes, it's like our sense of what form we take is being dissolved pretty darn massively, powerfully. And then Saturn, which rules all that Capricorn, is in Pisces. So again, it's being dissolved. <laughs> like our sense of, of what structure is, is just, it's going into the ethers. It's going into this Piscean energy, right? So what do we do? Like we're pretty conditioned. Again, I'm speaking for myself. I am I'm guessing maybe you would relate. You know, we're pretty conditioned to, we want to do something about it. We want to have a linear agenda. And, um, and I think a big part of what this time is calling us to do is basically just to relax, to relax into the arms of the divine, relax into the reality of ourselves as beings of light, beings of the shimmering, you know, that Celestia energy, the shimmering beauty and bliss and joy and sensuality, our bodies being really alive and awake and um, letting, you know, letting love lead, really. I think that's maybe the whole theme here is like, let's let love, let's come back to love. Let's surrender to true, true divine, actual earth love. Um, and let's let ourselves be taken into this new way of being and, and, and choose love over and over and over and over again. That, that would be my prayer and my mantra right now. Um, yeah. And again, you know, if, if you're having a similar experience that I've had where I'm noticed, I'm feeling a lot of grief, noticing what I feel, what I, and I could be wrong, but what I, what I'm judging is that certain people are not choosing the path of love. Um, to, to acknowledge and be present with maybe our grief, et cetera, and also to just come back to the choice that we have over and over and over again to be love, to surrender to love, um, and that we're held. We're so incredibly held. And we have all these beings, the Celestia energy, the massive angelic beings, the, the ocean beings, the earth beings, the angels, the unicorns, the um, the dragons, whatever it is, whatever it is you're feeling, it, it just, just be with it. Just let them hold you. Anything, you know, you can say a prayer for any and all benevolent beings who want to co-create with me, who want to We want to hold the space of light and love for the earth and for all of us as earth beings to, and cosmic beings to come back into the alignment that we are source. We are the divine. Um, you can just say, I welcome that any and all benevolent beings. I welcome you. Thank you. I'm here. I dedicate myself to you, to this, to are re-becoming the one <laughs> the name of the symposium that i'm hosting this whole month um not surprisingly i guess yeah okay i think that's all i feel called to say right now and yes if you haven't signed up for that re-becoming the one symposium definitely 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 do it's entirely free 34 talks free four panel discussions free and online um community sharing forum free. There are 14 optional paid workshops. If you want to support yourself, support the work being done in the symposium, we certainly appreciate that. And that's totally optional at the same time. Um, the last panel discussion, which will be live and recorded, will be next Thursday, June 29th. It's going to be co-hosted by me and Heather Ensworth. It's going to be really powerful <laughs> to, like that's what i'm feeling um so yeah i mean the people who are going to be on that panel are pretty amazing and heather's amazing and melanie reinhardt will be part of it um many of you are probably familiar with her amazing i mean just all the you know ari Marshall wolf 
will be on it. Um, Anne Bromley. It's, it's, I, I don't want to forget it. I don't want to leave anybody out. So I'm not going to try to name everybody because it's not it. I don't have it right in front of me. Um, but I could just just sum it up by saying these are incredibly powerful, deeply wise beings who I respect and love so much, every single one of them. And um, yeah, I just feel, I feel that panel discussion as an energy that we all need, that our world needs. And it's, I can't wait. I'm really excited about it. So uh, I hope you can join us either live or watch the recording. And, you know, this whole symposium is free and, and available indefinitely. So you have as long as YouTube exists to watch all of it. <laughs> um, yeah, so join us, please do. And please share it. Okay. Um, yeah, so beautiful, Celestia, greetings and blessings for you. And I would love to hear your thoughts on any of this. Um, I would love for you to share it if you feel called to do that. And yeah. Let's all feel those angels and feel the light and feel that love and come back to love. It's just, let's be love, please. <laughs> that's, that's my dedication, my prayer and my plan. Okay. <laughs> Sending love to all of you. See you really soon.